Well, hi, everybody. Welcome to episode 25 of Lean Whiskey. I'm going to hold up for those who are watching and see if that focuses a, a 25. That's the oldest whiskey I've got in the house, but I think we're going to keep doing episodes anyway. I'm Mark Graven. We're joined, as <laughs> usual, by Jamie Flinchbaugh. Jamie, how are you? I'm doing great, Mark. How are you doing? I'm doing okay. Um, we skated through. We, we were really blessed compared to a lot of other people in Texas. The house here did not lose power. Um, there's still a lot of people in a bad situation. So, you know, we'll okay. wish for a quick recovery and some root cause problem solving that prevents that from happening again. Yeah, hopefully opportunity to learn and get better for, for a lot of, lot of folks down there. So pretty rough. We hope so. Um, so best wishes to everybody who has uh, struggled or suffered through that in Texas and other states. And uh, we are joined today. We've got a special guest. We've got a third wheel. Happy to have him. He is Jim Benson. How are you doing, Jim? I'm doing well, Mark. Thank you. I'm going to ask a question, a kind of get to know Jim question. If you follow him on Twitter, you probably know his Twitter handle is at our founder. What's the story? I don't know if I even know the answer to this. What's the story behind the Twitter handle? Uh, well, it goes all the way back to 1981, <laughs> you <weren't>. uh, <laughs> before probably 90% of the people who are watching this were born. Uh, but um, in uh, mechanical drawing class uh, in, in Grand Island Senior High, uh, at that time, uh, my friend Dave Fisher and I had a zine that we published it was called Fisher Benson Video, and it was theoretically part of our video production company that never really existed, but was an excuse to have a post office box when we were not allowed to actually have a post office box legally. <laughs> and um, uh, I made a masthead one day in mechanical drawing class uh, for it. It's kind of like a cigar band masthead. And uh, I just put Fisher Benson Video. I think our slogan was, we'll be around to bury you. And uh, and I said, and I made a in the middle of the cigar band kind of looked like that. And Dave Fisher put this little person in the middle of it, and at the top wrote "our" and at the bottom wrote "founder," <laughs> kind of like that. Yeah. And since I was you know, 16 years old, I thought that was the funniest thing ever and proceeded to laugh so hard that we were sent to the principal's office for screwing around uh, in class. Yeah. Uh, but ever since then, uh, it has followed me around <laughs> yeah. uh, as uh, the thing that has just stuck through all of my artistic uh, pursuits. So at some point, you were our founder at AOL.com, I bet. Uh, no, I was never, I never did the AOL thing. Uh, no. I was a bunch of numbers at CompuServe.com. Uh, that works. <laughs> <laughs> and then I was our founder at, oh, I can't remember, what, but the, li the Seattle Library was the first place to give me a named email address. And I was our founder at whatever that was. And that was, yeah. that was forever ago. Huh. <laughs> and then, yeah, it's uh, always been our founder. Our founder has done many, many great things worldwide since then. Cool. Fun story. And the, the post-it count for those who can't see it is one so far. Jim is a prolific post-it note user. If you've seen him present and do all 40. kinds of things. <laughs> <laughs> I'm on my second post-it note for the, for the day. And one of the uses is a single tick mark, which is a brilliant use of a waste. A, that's a waste of a post-it note. <laughs> Um, it has got 70. Yeah. So uh, Jim and I, we're, we're going to do a quick plug. Uh, we recently did a LinkedIn live chat. That was a lot of fun. Yeah, and great. I took the audio of that and released it as episode 401 of the Lean Blog Interviews <laughs> podcast. And then we're doing something next month, Jim, if you want to tell the listeners about it. Okay. Yeah. On the 2nd of March, we're basically going to do exactly that thing again. <laughs> because it was so much fun, but we're going to use different words. Uh, so <laughs> uh, what that what that ended up being was a conversation, just a conversation between me and Mark about what it took to make a humane workplace 
you know, uh, and what the benefits of that were and what it took to maintain a humane workplace. Uh, and that it wasn't just huggy, you know, backfalls and walking on stones and stuff like REM would sing about. But uh, uh, we were actually trying to improve your business acumen by improving it. <laughs> yeah. uh, and uh, so that's what we're going to talk about again is, um, is, is those things tell some, tell some more stories and talk about some ways that we've actually done that. Yeah. So we'll put a URL in the show notes. Um, you can also find it. Jim has posted it on LinkedIn. It's listed as a webinar, but we're not going to PowerPoint anybody. No, no, there's no PowerPoint. Yeah. I've, I've proven quite a few times that uh, even though I have I sign contracts when I do webinars and they say you you must submit your PowerPoint and then I tell them there is none. So I've <laughs> been doing that for years. Yes, I will be happy to send you the title screen. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so Jim and I have been collaborating on that. Today's conversation will be a little more structured maybe than with those other things. Um, but Jamie, is there anything that you've got going on that you want to share with the audience? You're always doing new stuff. Always doing new stuff. I am working on the book. Uh, met with my editor and and uh, uh, provided a lot of feedback. And so I'm gonna gonna spend some time rewriting uh, some things and working on the structure of the book. So that's 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 making progress and and uh, you know just trying to not spend so much time shoveling out snow. That would be a nice change. Yeah. So Jamie, do you want to introduce the theme for today's whiskey yeah, we'll, section? We'll get into the whiskey uh, uh, relatively fast uh, this time. Sometimes it takes a while to get there. Yeah. But uh, yeah, given that you're you're back in uh, Dallas with the cold and, and I've shoveled snow every other day for the past two and a half weeks, well, um, we thought we needed sort of a, a wintry theme. Uh, You're going to be mad there, at so. me. It, it was it was like 65 degrees outside today, so I'm not feeling as well. Okay, now. it's not cold anymore, <laughs> but it's still February, so we'll yeah. we'll call it winter. Um, so we we wanted something peaty. Um, you know, the 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 smoke and the uh, the earthy tones of, of peat seem to seem to go well with winter, kind of don't seem to go as well with a hot July day. Um, so, so we, we picked something uh, peaty and um, there's a lot of ways whiskey can get, you know, get peat. Um, you know, sometimes the water, well, sometimes if you're using natural water, it flows through the peat bogs anyway. So water comes into huh. the distillery. Um, the, the barley is uh uh, malted or uh, dried out with burning peat, and that mm -hmm. that's probably the, that's really the main factor that, that yeah. goes on. But there's different kinds of peat um, uh, throughout Scotland. Uh, you get more woodsy peat uh, in the mainland. Um, uh, if you get on some of the islands, you get more of a mossy peat. But all of that can significantly change the the, the flavor and and give it give it some tone and and every. You know, every uh, every distillery of Scotch basically has you know uh, a, a standard for how much peat they're really going to carry. So that's our theme. Um, so just starting out, I, I kind of went with a, a, a fairly classic um, uh -huh. Scotch, um, uh, kind of a standard for me, something that I rarely don't have on the shelf at some point, and that's Lagavulin sixteen. Uh -huh. Um, Great choice. Although this bottle is, uh, uh, well, it won't last the night. So let's just say that. <laughs> um, Lagavulin is, uh, you know, not not that hard to find, and sixteen isn't is is quite good for the money. I think um, it, it, it's peated. Uh, its level is is thirty thirty five ppm, thirty five parts per million of phenol, which is kind of the the tracer that they use to mark the peat. Um, Again, because peat has different flavors, it's impossible to say uh, just because it has more. It's it's one thing or another since there's so many different flavor or varieties. But anyway, it's it's a it's not a peat monster, but it's it's up there for sure at, at 35 ppm. So that was a uh, that was mine. What's uh what's yours? So it turns out I've only got one Isla Scotch in the house, and it's not that. 
I mean, so, you know, peat is really associated with Isla. I've had other whiskeys, like I really like Ben Riek from Speyside, and they occasionally do some peated releases. So I'm going to have to go correct this, but at least I had an Isla whiskey in the house. I've often had, you know, an Ard bag laying around, but I finished that off. Um, Lafroig, Lagavulin are some favorites. So the one that I have right here is a blended malt whiskey, which, you know, blended just means it's more than one distillery. It's from a, a producer, a bottler called Samaroli. And so they do different releases because what they're doing is buying barrels and blending them. So it's not going to be the same release every single year. This is one that was bottled in, in 2017. And it's said on their website that they buy mostly, at least in this case, mostly from Lafroig, a few other Isla distilleries. Um, there were only 390 bottles of this one produced. So that was kind of cool. It's uh, aged eight years, at least according to the website. It doesn't say okay. that um, on the bottle. And so the Samaroli family, it's an Italian family, as it, as it may sound. So they were the first Italian company, the first non-Scottish or British company to recask and then age and blend Scotch whiskey. They've been doing that since 1968. So it's uh, it's it's not it's not a peat monster. I mean, for those who can see the color, you know, it's a fairly mm -hmm. light straw color. And but you know, one one thing I've learned, actually, I've got some Japanese peated whiskey in the house. Like the color. And the peat are not necessarily correlated, right? There's a there's a, a a belief that it is, and it certainly can be. But uh, I mean, you will see, you know, with with my Lafroig, it's got some of that that heavy caramel color mm -hmm. um, uh, to it. But uh, yeah, it's not not uh, just because it's darker; it's 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 yeah. peatier. Um, I do believe there's another Italian distiller, although I think they 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 don't blend; they're their own do their own distillery in scotland but um yeah lafroig lafroig known you know a little bit more of a peat monster um mm -hmm. and uh actually i i kind of grew tired of it over after after having a decent amount of it over a while uh just didn't yep. didn't have the appeal it used to have for me but you know it's taste yeah. change and and all of that but um, there's a time and a place for every whiskey yeah yeah does it does it tell you what the ppm level is no it usually it doesn't on you the gotta... website yeah um but i was thinking i, I probably I, I i forgot i had you know a couple of these peated japanese whiskeys including one i brought back from japan it's unaged in oak so it's clear but it it's peaty so that that's an interesting experiment or you can surprise somebody like here taste this i mean they'll yeah. smell it before they taste it but... that's that that might that might put the shock in them <laughs> so that's my whiskey here today and then the, the one i held up just quickly with the 25 is a blended scotch whiskey house of hazelwood i think this was picked up at heathrow okay on a trip back somewhere yes yeah, so always priced. always pick up something when you're going through heathrow um yeah. there's there's actually some that i bought that are only available at heathrow that's how <laughs> Um, mm -hmm. I, I think that's wrong that something should only be available at Heathrow, but, uh, <laughs> uh, that is, that is its own, um, its own marketing appeal, at least for the spontaneous buyer. So, yeah, uh, it works. Right. I give him credit for that. So, yeah. excellent. So Jim, what are you, uh, what are you drinking? Well, so I did not buy this at Heathrow, uh, although I do have several bottles downstairs, both Ardbeg bottles and uh, Highland Park bottles that they will only sell in uh, duty free. Mm -hmm. So Highland Park has a lot of like micro batches that they do where it, where it doesn't taste like something that they can release, but it tastes like some, but it tastes good. Mm -hmm. So they'll either blend those or they'll make them into a into a airport only release. And uh, so today, uh, I have a Highland Park 21, which is mm -hmm. kind of, uh, 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 it's at least snooty enough to have a beautiful bottle. <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, the Highland Park 18 is kind of how Tony Ann was originally introduced to uh, Scotch. And now she's a scary 
scotch aficionado uh <laughs> she 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 freaks men out worldwide by not needing them to hold her hand in, in, in drinking scotch um and uh so this is this is definitely peat forward uh and smoke on the back end uh super easy to to drink so it's not like peat to burn your face yeah <laughs> uh and what I like about it, I guess the other thing that I'll note here is that I'm drinking this out of, uh, th this is Milroy's, is a Scotch shop in Soho mm -hmm. in okay. London. Uh, very easy to get to on the tube. And uh, they are absolutely my favorite Scotch shop mm. on the planet. Okay. Um, you can walk in and you can say, can you give me something that tastes weird? <laughs> and they will very quickly produce bottles after bottles and say these things are weird and then you go through them and sure enough uh they're they're excellent for just finding the breadth of the flavor palettes of of scotch um so what what i liked about the 21 was uh there's a restaurant in Ed in edinburgh called michael nev uh wonderful restaurant they've closed and he's open another place down by the water but um they did scotch pairings for all for their tasting menus uh -huh. okay and that was actually the first time i'd had the 21 and they paired a 21 with venison and the peat of this with the strength of the venison was uh -huh. just wow yeah yeah it's why i hate covid <laughs> right. Wait, I said I can't do those things. Uh, right. It was it was just absolutely so amazing, um, and it's one of the things that I think gets lost in the cigar world of Scotch. Is that Scotch is really good with food? Yes, mm -hmm. yeah, really, really good with food. Yeah, I, I, I've definitely been through some pairings at some different restaurants uh, a couple of times, but. Um, you know, don't often have enough uh, whiskey partners to do that. And, and, and I'm also, you know, if I'm someplace I'm driving, I, I don't think I want a flight. So I <laughs> um, might just have one glass. So that's, that's an issue, but I, I definitely enjoy the Highland park. I don't think I've had the 21 year old. So that's, that's mm -hmm. pretty exciting to, yeah to try someday. I know that their, their Viking release, uh, special release was kind of even peatier. Mm -hmm. uh, and normally, a lot of those up there uh, aren't 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 as known for their peat. So, uh, mm -hmm. kind of interesting, yeah. interesting I, from from a Highland Park standpoint. I, so that's I, I, and those were releases. Yeah. So right. there's four different ones, four different Norse god ones that right. they released. Yeah. Yeah. Um, when you talk about pairings, um, Jamie, I know you like Dalmore. You did an episode with uh, with Susan. Yep. Yeah, I think we both did we Dalmore. both had Dalmore as Dalmore episodes. So, uh, mm -hmm. and I I might have used Dalmore once more uh, yeah. here as well. So um, I, I do enjoy that. We had the a chance, my wife. Origins. Yeah. Well, the, the and the, the the different expressions they have. My wife and I, you know, when we're in L.A., you know, uh, outdoor dining is you know finally um, just opened up again. But last year, while it was open, there was a restaurant downtown L.A that was doing a Dalmore dinner with a representative and the pairings with, with different meals. Um, so they did, uh, you know, the, the, the King Alexander expression, and then they actually opened up and poured, did we each get a half ounce? I mean, they opened up a Dalmore 40, which was oh, wow. quite a treat. Yeah, that was an oh wow moment. The, the rep said he doesn't get to do that very often, but I think coming off the pandemic, they haven't, this was like the first event he had done in eight or nine months. So right. I think we, we got kind of a treat for that. I do think Dalmore is, uh, uh, not to get too far down that rabbit hole, but it's, it's age state, it's, it's maturity relative to its age statements are always very well done, right? You yeah. taste an 18 Dalmore and it's, wow. it's, it's, it's richer than a 21 year old from many others. Right. So mm -hmm. it's just, you, I think you get a lot for your a lot for your age from Dalmore, so yeah. to speak. Yeah. All right. Well, cheers. 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 Good excuse to pour pour a nice whiskey here. Absolutely. So, so on to on to in the news. Um, 
And we may have spent a lot of time on this, but, um, you know, a lot of us have been working from home. A lot of people have been working from home. Yeah. And, you know, I've certainly been talking with executives all over the world. And it, it certainly seems that, you know, a lot of people are starting to lean towards, you know, more extensions of work from home. Uh, you know, a, a lot of it will get better when it gets better. But their their uh, um, predictions and, and, and planning is basically looking at the rest of this year in a lot of cases. So, um, you know, I, we, 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 there's many articles out there. We found one from Fast Company about, uh, you know, people finding the best spot in their in their house to work. Um, so we thought we'd just talk a little bit about working from home. Um, and and I, I guess I'll start with two two points just that I, I think for me color the whole the whole challenge. One is just some empathy for the situation that a lot of people mm-hmm. find themselves in. Two working right. parents can't get in home you know child care with you know five year olds running around uh, trying to do school in an open floor pant plan with no privacy. Right. So right. you know all the way to you know, no extra rooms or uh, poor, poor internet connections. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's just, it's all over the map, but there's a lot of people that just don't have the, the basics uh, available to them. And that's, uh, that's frustrating to see so many people struggling that way. Yeah. Um, The other, the other thing I think colors all of this is that I think a lot of people started working from home with a less than ideal setup. Uh, with the ability to fix it, but just decided they would power through. And they, they, you know, last, last March, they powered through until May, and then they started powering through to the end of summer, and then they started powering through to 2021, and, and they're still powering through. And they, they just, they haven't looked at their situation and said, what do I need to do to make it better? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So... So there's plenty of things people can can do to make it better in almost any circumstance. Um, uh, just a matter of well, figuring out how to problem solve your way through it. I mean, when you talk about just the ergonomics, how many people now have sore necks or bad backs? Like I try to very intentionally, I don't have the lumbar pillow here, but like I'm really trying to make sure that I sit upright instead of slumping over my computer but you know even if someone's just got a laptop without an external monitor you know you can get a twenty dollar stand that at least props it up a little bit so someone could sit and type without doing the old laptop hunch mm-hmm. yep. so we um not not to not to get overly political but in our courses before covid when we were telling people about dealing with complexity, we told them the story of uh, how Singapore was able to deal with SARS effectively by being able to do a lockdown and mm-hmm. and and deal with the, that epidemic in a coherent way. And one of the other things we always said was, can you imagine if America was hit by that? Mm. <laughs> so um, when the pandemic hit, Tony and I had this conversation and we're like, you know, we're probably going to be here for a long time. So the first thing I did was I bought this standing desk. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Then I noticed that Tony Ann was having issues. Like we'd be in a Zoom call and she'd be looking for stuff all the time. So one day while she was fiddling around, I just got onto uh, Amazon and bought her a second monitor mm. <laughs> and and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and a stand for it. And then she got that second monitor and then she kind of had this epiphany. She's like, oh my God, this is what screen real estate means. Yeah. And so now she's got monitors all over the place and stuff. And I think that like for a lot of people, it's that first step. First, the first step of admitting that you're actually in under house arrest, whether you like to mm-hmm. think of it that way or not. And then the second is that the changes that we can make, like you were saying, Mark, aren't that expensive. Not always. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, the desk was expensive, but but all of these other things have just been like little purchases, you know, over over time there, that have I mean, made that, all the difference in the world. I mean, there there are hacks where I've I saw somebody post um, they were using an ironing board as a stand up desk. And mm-hmm. so, I mean, in a pinch, there are things that that 
you could do. So, you know, it comes back to a lean theme of uh, creativity versus capital. I mean, the three of us are blessed with enough capital to take care of what we need for our for our office setups. But like, for for example, I, I, I'm not a two monitor guy. Like I've got a 27 inch monitor that to me is big enough where I can do a lot of things side by side. Not everything is in, you know, mm -hmm. full screen mode, but, um, yeah, well, so, and I, you know, we, we I all think have our that's, preferences. yeah, I mean, I, I've, I'm blessed that I, you know, I, I've spent a lot of money trying to make, uh, my, my home work environment, uh, more productive, more comfortable or sensible. Uh, uh, literally yesterday I, I, I've been, heating up water for tea. And so I finally bought a, 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 a water dispenser that will keep it hot. So I don't waste time heating water 10 times a day. Um, so yeah, you buy the toys that makes it better, make it better. But you know, I, I would, if I were stuck in a hotel for more than three hours doing work, there's a pretty good chance I would build a, a hacked up stand-up desk and it would usually be because I, I wouldn't sit in those chairs and i wouldn't sit at that desk so i'd i'd start by putting my uh putting my suitcase on top of the desk and if i needed more height i'd, I'd put a couple other things up and i've done it with stacks of books and and uh i have used an ironing board before um I'll, i'd use my suitcase but you know it, it's not that hard to find a way to change your body position enough to to get to get more comfortable um and i think you know even if you don't find the perfect spot just having more than one position is probably the most important yeah. advice just to to be able to change it up once in a while yeah and fighting i um, I, tr I did the ironing board thing i had an ironing board right over here set up for a de for a stand-up desk and my wife walks up and goes that's really embarrassing can you not do that <laughs> embarrassing why <laughs> it's a life hack they wiggle like crazy, though. Um, uh, yeah. uh, if they creak, if they make noise, that could be bad. Yep. Well, that's just how you know you're uh, you're productive. Yeah. Is the more creaking that's going on. <laughs> but I'm 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 laughing at myself. I see Jim laughing. I think what is Jim? Uh, he's thinking something that's making him laugh. I'm reminded. We're gonna I'm gonna date myself here. This is old, early 80s Eddie Murphy Saturday Night Live. It's a bit raunchy, but the, the one line and the one skit of like, have you always wanted to work from the comfort of your own bed? <laughs> <laughs> Some people yeah. now, you know, uh, you know, I don't know. Like, I would probably doze off and take naps. <laughs> well, and that's, that's it. I think there, you know, th there are some dangerous habits you can fall into. I know that I would, you know, when I was traveling, I would, I would slip, you know, do some work from bed um in my hotel room and and you know the more nights in a row you do that the less you know less comfortable and productive it is mm -hmm. you know i i used to be home so little that i'd almost always when i was home kind of go out for lunch and it was just like all right that's my treat i'm home might as well go get a cheeseburger or something and boy if i had kept that habit up with going to every day working from home i would have been in real trouble so you kind of have to watch watch what you, you certainly working from home every day you develop some habits and and some of those can be really good but you just have to watch yourself on the on the bad habits because those will those will sneak in pretty well pretty quickly well, too the, whether i'm going out or not one habit i've i've picked up again recently is literally scheduling time for lunch and then literally if i have to scheduling time to work out so that meetings don't get dropped into my calendar to a point where I'm like, yeah, I can't do that today. Yeah, I actually measure my, my clients have access to my calendar. And uh, so, you know, a lot of things can get dropped in, but I, I actually measure what percentage of my calendar is blocked uh -huh. as proactively, right? How, how, how proactive am I? It's a self-reflective measure, but how proactive am I at at deliberately blocking off time, usually for work stuff, but I mean, prep for this or, you know, be ready for that and, and make sure that I'm, I'm doing that. Otherwise, you know, I can be truly endless on, on, uh, on Zoom meetings um, uh, throughout, throughout the week. So uh, things you have to start to watch out for and be careful for. The, the, the Fitbit tells me that I need to walk a certain number of steps every hour 
I try and beat that by four times. <laughs> yeah. uh, but I do that by by setting a Pomodoro when I'm not meeting with clients and making sure that every half hour I get up and walk around. Yeah. And what I found is that when I wasn't doing that, sitting here at the desk, I was maybe getting about six hours in before I became just a complete zombie. And when I started doing that, uh, I could end of the day, you know, feeling, feeling fully energized. Mm -hmm. And that's been, that's been a godsend. So actually that monitor just sits there and it just has our Kanban on this side and it has this timer on the other side. And that's all that monitor does. Mm -hmm. That is my visual control screen. Oh, yeah, I actually have a Pomodoro clock that you just, you just put it down a certain way and it starts the timer and, mm -hmm. and we'll, we'll go off. Uh, and I don't use it as much as I used to, but um, I would use it for, for not reminding me to stop, but kind of keeping me focused on a task long enough. Yeah. Uh, but I, I do think, you know, there is something for setting up some, some, you know, understanding your different styles of work and making sure your work environment is conducive. Mm -hmm. um, you know, for, for me, it's, you know, it's writing, it's, it's design work, uh, it's meetings, it's administrative stuff, right? There is different, different styles, but, you know, when I'm sitting at sitting in the desk where I would normally do a bunch of meetings, it's a horrible place for me to write. Mm -hmm. So I just make sure I have a different place where it, it helps trigger my brain to say, that, okay, now you're in writing mode and because mm -hmm. uh, you're in a, in a different spot. Um, yeah. So you do have to manage your space and manage your manage your psyche, just because it can get it can get very locked in, and uh, you get the wrong habits to squeeze out the right ones. So I think there's there's physical setup, and then there's I think like avoiding mental barriers and and distractions. So you know I've worked from home at least part time going back to. 2005, meaning like if I wasn't on the road as a consultant or something, I was in home office. Mm -hmm. Obviously, there's been more of that now for it be going on almost 12 months now. Um, but I've always been real disciplined about not just leaving TV on as background noise, whether that's news or ESPN or whatever. It's just, you know, I don't need that background noise. I try to listen to music. And, and certain types of music I found are more conducive. The one thing I struggle with, though, is the internet distraction machine. And there are times mm -hmm. I've played around with, you know, on the phone, you can set screen time restrictions, including, let's say, social media category. Um, and, and, you know, there, there are browser plugins, even, um, where you can limit how much time you spend on, let's say, LinkedIn or something like that. But yeah, those are it's it's tough when your your work is in the cloud, right? I mean, I use Google Google Drive, and so you know, I use Trello. I you know, that's that's where most of my work is. I can't I can't unplug from the internet and still be productive um, unless I'm on paper. As some certain things or on my whiteboard, certain things I can do where I can step away both from a computer and from the internet, but. Um, if I'm on a computer, there's a pretty good chance I also need to be on the internet. And it's, it, it is, uh, it's one of the reasons I still like my Kindle because, you know, when I would try to read on an iPad or another tablet, it's like, well, there's other, there's other stuff there. And you <laughs> drop out of book mode and pop into something else. I have, my I have turned off notifications on most everything, my phone, my tablet, Right. And and my computer has very few notifications of anything, and that helps. With my iPad, I do a lot of reading on the iPad, and I don't want to be distracted. Um, I, th there are the notification settings. Actually, I put it in airplane mode and then turn on Wi-Fi, because then there's this message that says, basically, there will be no notifications while you're in airplane mode. So that's one little trick. But I still have to be disciplined of you know not spending too much time on, you know, you always rationalize social media, like, well, you know, this exposure could be helpful for marketing, you know, but yeah, there, there's, there's a point where it's not. Well, and, and I, and I think you got to create a little white space for yourself too. So, you know, it, it's, don't, don't pretend you should be disciplined for 
you know, nine hours or 12 hours a day. Um, I think it's every single day it's asking too much. So whether it's walks or it's, you know, you, you do turn off and deliberately go watch some television or read or whatever, just to mentally switch gears, um, you know, give yourself a break for that. <laughs> it's That's why God created my grill. <laughs> <laughs> And I see pictures of what Jim cooks and he's good with that grill. But yeah, I mean, men mental space, um, you know, they, having some sort of virtual water cooler type function wherever you find that can be helpful, I think. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing that's missing right now, right? Is the like uh, sometime like Mark or sometime over the last 12 months, we would have found time to have dinner. Yeah. Or you would have made me a pizza in your Lone Star pizza oven <laughs> or something. Uh, and um, uh, I, I'm finding that not only am I missing that, but my clients are missing that. And so the other day we did a um, uh, initially a value stream mapping exercise that turned into an OKR exercise. And um, in the middle of creating the OKRs, one of the people became like really upset and had to leave because th they really wished that we were together in a room. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And, and right. what we, what I figured out that we're missing isn't the ability to do the exercise. It's the ability for people to be in the room and not do the exercise, uh -huh. like mm -hmm. to have side conversations to stare off into space and not feel like someone's going to see them on camera staring off into space. Uh, you know, and like, just, you know, whenever I would do a, a uh, affinity mapping exercise with people, the whole room would just be alive with conversation. And now when we do one, people are very quiet because you only have one stream of communication and no one wants to mess that up. Yeah, that's that's where I, I encourage people to use other other streams of communication, right? So if there's a group on a call, then hop into the chat, right? Mm -hmm. It's it's okay, right? You mm -hmm. when you were in person, you weren't solely listening to the one person speaking, right? You were focusing on other things. So go ahead and have a little side chat on in the chat, um, joke around in the chat. Mm -hmm. Text, you know, I, when you're not in a meeting, use use text and use IMs. Use other. It's not as good, of course, right? But mm -hmm. but use other mechanisms other than setting up a one on one in a in a Zoom meeting. So yeah, um, you know, I, I I do think being at work isn't about having a place to work. It's about connection. It's about culture. It's about collaboration. And, and so we have to make sure going back to work is is purposeful. But, uh, but yeah, we, we, in the meantime, we just can't wait for that. Right. We've got to find other ways to keep the connections, the culture and the collaboration going. And so, yeah, I, I've, I've had people that might be like listening to a webinar and they said, Oh, I'm kind of, you know, we used to all get in one room and, you know, watch a webinar together and talk about it live. I'm like, right. Great. Start a chat. Yeah. And talk about it live. Right. It's not quite the same, but it's a lot better than just everybody sitting there. Yeah, you know, sterile. I mean, we shut we, up and we, talk. <laughs> we, t we we do you know, and in, in Kinexus meetings, um, people are pretty aggressive about using the chat function. I mean, I mean, they're 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 using it a lot, and sometimes it is side jokes and whatever. And there's been, I mean, I think that's been a healthy thing. Like, it's not so much where it's a total distraction, but you know, you, especially when company like Kinexus has hired employees during the pandemic. You've got to get to know people's personalities a little bit. Some people don't speak up as much in a Zoom meeting, but the stuff they add into the chat is either helpful or insightful or sometimes laugh out loud funny. Right. But, but here, here's the, the pro tip around Zoom chat. If you're in a meeting, and, and this, I don't think this has been updated um, in the software, but I know at one point this was a fact. If you're in a meeting and somebody is recording that meeting and I send a snarky private message to Jim Benson, all of that gets recorded with the meeting. So <laughs> if, it's, if it's not something you would want everybody to see, then I guess keep it to a text message. <laughs> 
Right. Or better yet, don't be snarky. Or, but. or don't say it, right? I mean, <laughs> I think if, if, if you're not willing to, to have it read out loud in, in court, you know, they, they kind of said, don't write the email if you don't want it read out mm -hmm. in court. I would say, don't say it at all <laughs> if you're not okay with it being read out loud in court. So, yeah. Um, but, but yeah, I think it's okay to have, you know, again, in person, you know, people step out of a meeting room and go have a side conversation while they go get a drink of water. So, you know, allow for that freedom to, yeah. you know, not everybody has to be single, single stream of consciousness uh, connected to the, the one speaker in a Zoom meeting. Yeah. Well, we had some uh, some listener questions. If we if we've uh, talked enough about that, that we <laughs> thought we'd get into. Do you want to? Do you have yeah. anything else we want to talk about in, in 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 work from home, or do you want to move on to listener questions? Hit it. All right. So, question number one: Is there a common lean term expression or quote that you think gets butchered or misunderstood? That's a good one, Jamie. Do you want to go first? Sure. I, I, I think one that I, I just, it's, it's not that it, it bothers me the most. It's probably the one I hear the most that I end up trying to correct. And it's people saying some version of here's my lean project. And, you know, I'll say I, I, I've done this for 30 years. I, I, just, I don't know what that means. What, what is a lean project? Is it, is it sanctioned by the lean gods? Uh, what, what does that even mean? So, um, but that's kind of what they do mean is like, oh, this is mm -hmm. this is what I want to get credit for as being part of lean. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, OK, did you do some direct observation. Did you do some experiments? Did you get to root cause? I'm, I'm happy to hear all those wonderful things that you might do along the way. But I don't know what a lean project is. And and I think every time we do it, we, we say things like that. Uh, we we. We're using lean in such an ambiguous way that it has no meaning. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, that's right. When people say, I, here's my lean project, it's like, well, that's lost all meaning. I have no yeah. idea what that is. Uh, stop using the ad lean as an adjective in the wrong places. Yeah, I, my, my corollary to that is when people use lean as a synonym for good. Yes. And sometimes really <laughs> wildly unclear ways like you'll see somebody post some mock-up of a paper boarding pass and like oh look it's a lean boarding pass i'm like what does that in what way like what do you well, paper how is that i mean like what is that yeah, mean we, what does that mean there's that paper waste and I mean, it's just it, it's 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 mean it's kind of meaningless sometimes so i i try to press people like more specifically what do you mean is this better quality does this have better flow is this an environment where people are listened to and engaged? Yeah. I mean, I think you have usually to they just specific. mean it shorter. <laughs> yeah. Well, and that that's um, yeah. I think the the synonym for good is 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 part of it. I mean, we we've, we've seen you know people listing out leadership behaviors and go, oh, traditional is low integrity and lean is high mm -hmm. integrity and. Like, I know for for thousands of years we've had high integrity people and low integrity mm -hmm. people. It's just. And, and high integrity acts and low integrity acts. It's there's no leanness in that. Like, of course, your lean journey is going to be more successful when people carry about with, with integrity. But boy, I want to give lean credit for a bunch of things. But the concept of integrity, I don't think is one of them. Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, so if you guys oh, think that ahead. that's a thing, you should mm -hmm. you should meet my friend Agile. <laughs> yeah, has no definition anyway. So the definition for it has literally become all things good. So it's like you know, wow, today I didn't stub my toe. That's totally agile, <laughs> uh, and uh, it's a uh, it's a problem because when people go to have an agile transformation, it has literally zero definition. So then it just becomes the products that people mm -hmm. are trying to sell them, like Scrum. Yep. And then you lose any hope of ever having the philosophical background and you just get a bunch of practices that someone put into a book. Yeah, yeah I, I saw this with the, the, the SAFE team uh, released. Uh, SAFE is the uh, worst. Uh, an article about... Uh, Safety first. SAFE finally applied to hardware development. And so I read, I read the article and I'm like, it was... 
It was entirely lean product development concepts that we've been talking about between five and 10, maybe 15 years. Mm -hmm. And it was, you know, I mean, it went straight down the path of set based design and knowledge uh, derivatives and stuff. So it's, it was without really giving credit to any of it. And hmm. I, I'm not sure it was intentional, but it certainly reads as if they invented all these things. And uh, it's not intentional because they don't know where it came from. <laughs> well, yeah. And that's sloppy research is not quite as big a sin as, as deliberately co-opting people's hmm. content, but it's, it's yeah, it's second degree murder. Yeah. <laughs> that's fair. It's a conceptual <laughs> manslaughter, but, um, yeah. There, well, so safe that that means what? Scaled agile framework for enterprises? Is that no? Right? It's just scale scale agile framework, and okay. it's safe because they because they had to come up with a name for it. But if you actually spell it out, it's actually suffer. <laughs> <laughs> and 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 what it is is it's basically every idea someone else had tossed into a big bucket so that consultants can teach you things mm. endlessly. Mm. It It's a frightening anti-pattern for coaching, yeah. but it is a make work project for consultants. So if mm. three of us decided that we wanted to just have endless work, we could, we could, we could hush, hook our, hook ourselves up to that. And like, not, not that I have any opinions about this, no. but, but like any, like any, uh, <laughs> any bit of content, uh, coming from the bookshelf behind me, for example, is, you know, in the end, if the company doesn't take ownership, if leaders inside the company don't take ownership for their own intellectual pathway, their own intellectual journey, all of this stuff can be used in the same way, right? It yeah. all can be jammed down people's throats in an endless, endless barrage. So, um, yeah, I guess, I guess I'll, 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 pull integrity back in. There's a high integrity way to deliver these ideas and there's a low integrity way. <laughs> well, we, we can sell high integrity lean 6.0. I'm going to trademark that by the URL. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll use 5.0 because I think, you know, anybody who's not ready for 6.0, I'll, I'll, I'll get to sell them 5.0. High Next. integrity lean is nice because that's hill. So your, your journey can either be an uphill journey or a downhill journey. Oh, journey. <laughs> So this is, this, these are answers to a different question. We can talk about some other time. What lean cliche are you most tired of? But yep. the, to me, the word transformation is a word that I would like to be stricken from a lot of the conversation. Because I think mm. transformation is so rare and it sets the bar really high. Um, you know, maybe that's the goal and we could talk oh, about it. It's a anyway. fair point. I, I certainly use it. Um, oh, I, I do too. I, I probably am sloppy in how I use it. Uh, I'll have to think I think that, that anyone that's on their transformation journey will surely journey along to transformation as soon as they're able to figure out where their transformational journey is leading. <laughs> I, so, I think that transformation and journey sit right on the same plate of highly fatty foods of, of jargon. Um, and what they imply is that the coach knows the destination. And I find that ridiculously simultaneously insulting and dangerous. Yeah. And what we're not teaching people is <laughs> you're going to have to get comfortable with the fact that you don't know what your destination is mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that we are constantly building roadmaps that as you look forward, have greater variation right. as the time that you're projecting goes out and that you are building yourself different strategies to mitigate complexity in the short term and in the long term. And when you can get a group to figure that out, you are instantly out of a job. Yeah. And that's like the most awesome moment ever. But there was a great phrase Karen Martin used. We did an episode of My Favorite Mistake together. And it was something to the effect of the arrogance of certainty. Or like wanting certainty of here's our three year transformation journey plan. Like that's that's just that's that's arrogant. Nobody has a crystal ball. To your mm -hmm. point, Jim, we can have some sense of direction, but to think we can script that out any more than any of us could script out the next five years of our career mm -hmm. is, you know, it's silly. You've got to be willing to 
respond and adapt to things as they're happening. That 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 plan needs to change. Sometimes. So, so the 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 interesting thing about that is that investment entirely hinges on false certainty. Mm-hmm. And so if we suddenly as a as a world understood the full weight of false certainty, we would stop investing in things, we would stop planning for th- <laughs> so so the question then is is how how can we say, okay, I understand that I have a goal and my goal is audacious. And that in order to get there, I'm going to end up steering this car around a lot of obstacles. How do I get comfortable with the fact that my plan isn't going to happen, but something else pretty good is? Uh, yep. And then how do you pitch that? Do you pitch that as a bunch of potential outcomes? Do you pitch that as one certain outcome and then just say, oh, by the way, this probably won't happen? You know, that that's the tough thing. So like right now we're trying to pitch the VCs and I feel very uncomfortable going to the VCs and saying this thing will end up doing this and making this <laughs> much money. Yeah. Because I'm cursed with an understanding of variation. Yeah. And uncertainty. <laughs> yeah. That thing messed me up, man. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. So let's get back to the question at hand here. Yeah. Uh, I mean, so do you have a, do you have a favorite phrase but... that... Uh is misunderstood mark yeah i mean to me i think it's misuse of a word when people talk about like oh our organization does four kaizens a week and what they mean is kaizen events Mm -hmm. and so then i get stuck on well if you mean kaizen event say kaizen event and that that's that's kind of all sometimes we talk about pet peeves um you know, I think if, if, if it's an event, you have to use the modifier. Don't be lazy. Because, like, to me, there are small improvements. Like, I would be really disappointed if a hospital said, oh, we do four Kaizens a week. I mean, I would ask, like, what, per person? And they would mean, well, no, we have four scheduled out, planned out, week-long Kaizens. I'm like, okay, those are Kaizen events. You could also have dozens or hundreds of small Kaizens. So it's funny. Like, when I say Kaizen and Joe Schwartz and I in, in our Healthcare Kaizen book, when we say Kaizen's, his organization says Kaizen's meaning small improvements, and they do thousands a year. And um, so, I like to me within the family tree of Kaizen's, you could you could have Kaizen's, and then under that you have Kaizen events and quick and easy Kaizen's, as Norm Bodak dubbed it. Rest rest in peace. But. And if Kaizen events isn't a, even if the volume of events is increasing, if it's not a shrinking percentage of your overall improvement, uh, you're probably not headed in the right direction. So um, over-reliance on events is uh, a surefire way to to very effectively control, but also limit uh, your ability to be successful. To make all your Kaizen events push. Yep. Yep, all all formal lean. So, so Jim, Jim do you have a do you have a lean term or expression or quote that gets misunderstood a lot? Oh, hundreds. But I've been I've been mulling. Saying, what what am I going to say when we get around to me? <laughs> yeah. And I think that um, mine is not going to be a surprise to Mark, but it's respect for people is that Lean loves to say that we have respect for people and then we send jerks out into the field to beat the (laughs) crap out of people who are honestly making an effort to improve. Uh And they come out and say, you're not doing this right, you're not doing that right. But when you say we, you don't mean, we don't literally do that, but some do that. (laughs) Oh yes, of course. Well, we we are, we're, we're, we're woke. (laughs) <laughs> woke lean 7.0 <laughs> we do things in a lean way that's right we, yeah we're, we're, we're lean about lean and, and so the thing is is that i've noticed across the board that for lean and agile people are so focused on the tools and the activities and they assume that those are going to mm. cause these amazing religious epiphanies in people but what they really do is they just give people more shit to do <laughs> and then those people are like, we can't wait for these lean consultants to go away so I can get back to work. 
Mm -hmm. And we're not building humane systems for people to actually engage in continuous improvement inside of. And I think that, and Mark's written about this already, but there's the, the Deming quote about 94% mm -hmm. of the time it's the system. And what he didn't mean is 94% of the time it's the assembly line. Right. <laughs> there's a social system there as well that supports the professionals doing the work and is supported by the professionals doing the work. And if that's not healthy, you're never gonna get a culture of continuous improvement. And right now the lean cannon provides scant little mm -hmm. tooling uh, to deal with that particular issue. So when, when, when you talk Deming and, and Jamie, maybe we'll, we'll throw a link to this in the show notes, but the one that I almost talked about was a Deming quote. And I wrote a blog post in uh, 2013 that said, don't threaten people with this famous Dr. Deming quote. Because oh, the, the, <laughs> the quote is, it is not necessary to change. Survival is not mandatory. And people will bludgeon people with that quote, meaning basically, you need to do what the bleep I'm telling you to do. And I'm like, I don't think that's yeah. really what any of the intention of any of that was. Yeah, I, I think, um, yeah, because I, I wrote about respect for people as, you know, in, in the past and how it's misused. I think it is, it's thrown around like a bumper sticker. <laughs> Yeah, uh, quite quite often, and and I think you know people try to be nice, and it's like oh I don't I don't that person's not nice, so therefore it's not respect for people. Mm -hmm. um, but but even well, even things like oh well you know you held them accountable, that's not respect mm -hmm. for people. It's like no, actually lack of accountability is showing lack of respect. So you know you, you gave them autonomy but not accountability. That's just that's just you know you wouldn't do that to your own kids. So why would you do that to another human being? So. Cool. I think there's a lot of uh, respect for people often is like just just hands off. Just don't do anything. Get out of the way instead of engage and support and have have conflict conversations. All of those things are are, are signs of greater respect, not not you know, there, avoidance is the opposite of re respect. Yeah. I don't know if it's the opposite, but it certainly is contrary to cool. respect. Well, there, there's a difference between um, challenging people. Toyota uses the word challenge a lot. It doesn't mean you need to be a bleep about it, mm -hmm. right? There's a fine line. And there are some people, and Jim and I are, this is, a, this is verbally, so it's not a subtweet, but we're basically subtweeting out loud. Like there are some people still running around thinking that they are the second coming of Taiichi Ono. And because Ono had a reputation of being a jerk, therefore they are entitled to be a jerk. And I'm like, I don't think that flies in the year 2021. I don't think it flies any time, but no, yeah. no offense to Ono, but <laughs> Ono, Ono was operating in a different time. And he had this reputation of people would say, oh no, it's, you know, they would call him Mr. Oh no, as in, oh no, he's coming. And, and like, obviously there's a lot to be thankful for, for the contributions of Mr. Ono, but it doesn't mean we are entitled to act like him. Yeah. It's like, like, uh, I, I, I use Elizabeth Holmes just cause it comes up, you know, thinking she's like Steve, you know, she, she started to dress like Steve jobs and <laughs> therefore I'm, I am like, let's copy everything about Steve jobs and not even understanding why you're doing it. So, um, yeah, Teichi Ono was, you know, had had some good things, had some bad things. Some of it was contextual. Some of mm -hmm. it was the sign of the era. Some of it was the sign of the situation they found themselves in. Sure. Yep. Um, all all conditions that have nothing to do with where you find yourself right now. Yeah, then I, um, I think the word accountability. I, I mean, accountability is a good thing, but. This happens a lot in healthcare. We're going to hold them accountable means we're going to blame the individuals for these systemic problems. And that's why I cringe when I hear in that context, different than I think you would mean it, Jamie. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, you very cringe, rarely right? hear somebody building, hear, being held accountable for something that's gone right. <laughs> um, right. If you can build a system with a group of people in it, or if they can build the system, preferably, where they understand what their roles and responsibilities are professionally accountability always comes with that and it usually comes around with that as as an outgrowth of agency as opposed to an outgrowth of did you do your job description um and there's so many 
we we're still carrying a lot of Tayloristic weight on our shoulders, mm-hmm. regardless of what industry we touch. Um, where you know PMI is still largely uh, a Tayloristic uh, framework, and there's a lot of project managers out there that have been bathed in that water. Yeah. And so the, the question is, you know, at what point do we actually begin to understand? You no, know, servant leadership is a pendulum swinging, you know, way past acceptability. <laughs> How can you get someone who understands as a leader that they're supposed to actually be decisive yet be a team member? How do they how do they how do they balance that? How do they balance that with the needs of middle management and understanding that middle management is given KPIs to meet that people give them to them and they walk out of the room and then middle management's like, well, now I just work for the KPI. Yeah. It's like no, that's not that's not right either. So the the healthy org is something I think that the evolution of lean is going to have to deal with that we've been unwilling to deal with because we've been fixated on the shop floor for so long. Did 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 you say did you intend evolution to sound like evil evolution? No, no, I uh, ev- evolution can sound like is. Uh, Evan Lucian. I, I think I've discovered. <laughs> is that a Seattle accent or a Nebraska accent, Jim? <laughs> I, I, I'm a man of the world, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> it's, so keep, keep in mind, we haven't really measured our uh, second <clears throat> glass of whiskey accent either. So right. Um, <laughs> so hey, can I throw something fun out there? Like I think we might have to jump to. Um, mm-hmm. The closing fun question, but I'm going to see uh, Jamie and Jim, this will be better for the YouTube viewers, but I have this lean blog coffee mug that I made. And I think you're both of the age where you will get the reference to what's on the other side. And I'll preface it by saying this design, which I had put onto a t-shirt and I bought one of these t-shirts. And then shortly after the company that makes said t-shirts shut it down and said it violated copyright. (laughs) <laughs> you get the reference so we yeah. want to explain it so it's a mug that says in big letters choose and then in bigger letters lean yeah do you remember the artist i don't remember the artist do you remember jim i'm trying i'm, I'm I think on my you, second you, second, boop, boop. second gram all right so it's the 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 jeopardy noise george michael in oh, yeah. one one of their wham i think it might have been wake me up before you go go he wore a t-shirt for whatever reason said in huge letters choose life mm-hmm. yep. and i thought that's a dubious copyright claim to say that putting choose anything in big letters like that i mean it's reminiscent of the george michael t-shirt well, that was the inspiration parody, they, they didn't think that it was the drug lean that you were promoting did they no, but yeah, parody is allowed, right? Right. I, I mean, I shouldn't do law while drinking, but um, <laughs> but, but parody parody is is a is a workaround for it's copyright protected. infringement, so to speak. So um, did they hashtag use that as the reason why, or did they just do it unexpectedly? It just said copyright that there were. I, they 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 acted like there was that somebody had actually made a claim. So whatever record label that owns that music may have, I don't know, but hashtag not a lawyer, hashtag don't sue us. <laughs> well, so in the, in the early, in the mid, I guess the late nineties, um, I put a song that we had recorded in high school up onto mp3.com. And it was a standard um, talking blues riff, um, but so was Crossroads. And That's so we Clapton, put that up there. They're like, right. they're like, this is a ripoff of Eric Clapton. And we're like, no, it's not. It's, it is a ripoff of every other <laughs> talking blues song ever. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> That's that's called a genre. Right. <laughs> yeah. But of course, there was no there was no appeals process. Mm-hmm. So uh, so uh, down to the city never never was released and never made all of the cool money that it could. <laughs> Well, let's uh, before we we do delve too deep into the law. Let's uh, let's end with our last uh, our closing fun question. Um, so, so is there a movie or TV show that you've recently watched 
that, that you did have high hopes for but were disappointed in. Uh, so, Mark, why don't you go first? Yeah, so for me, that's an easy one. It was a movie. The trailer looked really good. Um, oh, this is the whiskey talking. Um, from Saturday Night Live. Um, she was in Bridesmaids. Oh, my gosh. I'm bad with I'm bad with uh, Hollywood names. Chris, uh, Kristen Wiig. Kristen Wiig. Yeah, Kristen Wiig. So um, Barb and Star go to Vista Del Mar. The trailer looked great. Uh, my wife and I were in the mood to, to watch a comedy. Put down 19.99 for the new release Amazon rental, and that movie was not. I mean, the trailer was not indicative. Like that movie was a stinker. Like I think we watched about 30 minutes and. Like, no, I'm not going to suffer through this anymore. I did learn through Amazon customer support chat, you can uh, get a refund if I'm sure they can look and say like, yeah, he only watched 30 minutes of it. Either he fell asleep or he really didn't like it. And I really didn't like that movie. I like, I like silly, I like silly comedies. Don't get me wrong. I, it's not that one. Yeah, uh, that's. That's too bad. I'm not a I'm not a huge comedy guy, but uh, it's always nice to see a good a new one come along. Um, so so f- for me, I, I kind of have two answers to this. One one is um, as a as a soccer guy and 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 an Everton fan. Everton played you know near bottom of the table Fulham last weekend and just got just got torn apart. It was it was bad, and I watched it and. Uh, um, and so I was really disappointed in that uh, in that performance, uh, but um, they did make up for it yesterday, Saturday. Uh, playing Liverpool, they're arch rivals. This is the Yankees Red Sox for those that don't understand the reference. Um, and uh, you know, imagine if the Red Sox had 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 not beaten the Yankees in Yankee Stadium for 20 years. That's what this was. Uh, Everton had not beaten Liverpool at Liverpool Stadium in 20 years, and they. And they did um, a nice little victory. So that so that was a nice turnaround. Um, but 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 last night we decided same twenty dollars. Right? Uh, we decided to rent uh, Wonder Woman nineteen eighty four. Mm. And I, I'm, I'm not a huge fan of the DC stuff. I, I, I haven't thought much of what they did was good. But I thought Wonder the original Wonder Woman was fantastic. Just storytelling, right? Just good storytelling. Um, and then you know I'm a child of the '80s, so anything, anything that's you know 1980s, like okay, that's got to make it fun too. And it just wasn't good. It, mm. Its '80s references were were jammed in and and uh, arbitrary. Um, and the storyline just didn't hold together. Uh, I'm not even sure the acting was was that great. Um, it was just missing a lot. Mm. I, I was it wasn't bad. It, you know, I don't want to say it was a bad movie. I think it was better than some of DC's other movies, but compared to the original Wonder Woman, just doesn't doesn't even come close. Yeah, I had heard enough bad things about Wonder Woman 1984, where that Barb and Star movie, it was literally the first day it was released, and I took the plunge. And now maybe someone else didn't watch it because they saw me rant about it on Facebook, right, Jim? Probably. Probably so. Then that's that's fair. We can all save ourselves, save each other from a little, a little pain. So, Jim, what would you? Uh, what would be your choice? Oh, Did we... oh Sorry, we can't my, hear you. Jim. My household largely revolves around food, uh, and there are uh, literally fifteen seasons of the Great British Menu. Uh, which is a bunch of different British chefs get together mm-hmm. and uh, try and make the best menu so that they can go cook for Paul McCartney or something in the end. And um, it was one of those shows that, I don't know, they, they, they must have reached across to the States for the format <laughs> where they unnecessarily made it uh, antagonistic. And it was so antagonistic that we, I think we only made it through like a season and a half where each, each successive episode made us more angry. (laughs) (laughs) 
Wow. <laughs> so we, we, we like watched the first season thinking, okay, this can't stay this bad. And then we got into the second season and they were so antagonistic and so mean to each other that we're like, you know what? No, let's, let's just stop. And one of the, one of the things about, um, so uh, Dan Levy hmm. hosted the great Canadian baking show. Yeah. <laughs> and when they asked him, they said, dude, you're like at the top of your career. Why would you like waste your time <laughs> hosting the great, the great Canadian baking right. show of all things? And he was like, this show respects the people that are on it. And they yeah. respect each other. And he mm. said, the first time I saw the Great British Baking Show, he's like, he tweeted, if, if this ever comes to Canada, I have to host uh. it. <laughs> and uh, I, I thought it was interesting. There's, there's things on both sides. Uh, and that, uh, that, I don't know, that was the thing. It, it was just so mean. It was like, I, did, so, I, don't need, I don't need, you know, blood sports in my food. Yeah. Right. So no Gordon Ramsay. Uh, no, yeah, Gordon little, Ramsay's a special case. Okay. A little bit of that uh, goes a long way, though. Yes, yes. And, well, and so one of the things that you'll I, notice on Top Chef is that, that, that it was the longest makeover show in history, and the makeover was actually Gordon Ramsay's personal perception <laughs> <laughs> so by the time you get to the like the later ones where like they have the kids and stuff mm -hmm. he he's he's like happy grandpa gordon ramsay right mm. where every so often he'll show up and say you know god damn it cook better but he's not the total jerk that he was in the beginning right. which is interesting because it's the same thing that happened with anthony bourdain because mm. at the beginning anthony bourdain's just like i'm i'm an egomaniacal moron yeah, and then right. as you got farther and farther into his series he got a lot more empathy for the for the things he was doing yeah so let, let, let me give two positive shout outs though because i i often talk about the stuff i don't like um it's not quite the same but similar time slot on cnn the stanley tucci italy show i thought the first episode of that was really good tucci is not bourdain but I do mm -hmm. recommend that show from a sense of travel and exploration and food because the first episode was Naples and pizza. That was a lot of it. But then mm -hmm. the other thing I did like, you mentioned Linda Carter, Jamie. New to Disney Plus, to people who have access to that, all five seasons of the original Muppet show from the late 70s yep. <laughs> is now available. And we watched three episodes. And like, that is such a delightfully weird show. Like, to watch it as an adult. I'm like, okay, wow. I was, you know, there, there's crazy stuff there um, that I saw as a kid. But the, the Linda Carter episode um, is, is fantastic. And she can actually really sing. Mm -hmm. Linda Carter can really sing. Florence Henderson also, mm -hmm. amazing singer. We saw her episode too. Yeah, Linda Carter at the end of Wonder Woman 1984 was perhaps the best part of it. Um, yeah. And uh, but uh, yeah, we we started rewatching Muppet Show on Disney Plus. Oh, uh, good. Uh, George, God, they got up through George Burns. So uh, uh, fantastic, <laughs> we're, fantastic. We're, stuff. we're we're skipping around. We did Johnny Cash, and I, I think John Cleese is what I'm going to watch next. Nice, nice. That All right. Was, All right. I think that brings us to the end, Mark. I think it does. So we want to thank everybody for listening. Uh, you can find the 24 past episodes and this one at leanwhiskey.com. You can spell whiskey like your scotch or like you're spelling it like bourbon or as if you're Canadian. It'll point you to the same place, leanwhiskey.com. <laughs> We've thought about scenario planning here, Jim. All right. You can't predict what way people are going to try to spell whiskey. No. Nope. Um, or you can, or you can get not that way, um, <laughs> or or you can find it at Jamie's website. That is uh, jflinch.com slash lean whiskey. And you know, please do look for us if uh, if you've found this because let's say you're a huge fan of Jim Benson and you're now listening. Maybe you'll listen to some non Jim Benson episodes. You can subscribe through Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, um, all of the usual places. And please, there are no non-Jim Benson episodes. No, yeah. <laughs> They're one and only. Uh, we do appreciate you know, rate us, review us, um, 
a subscribe. You know, these things, these things not just help us, they help you. Uh, they help other listeners. Really do appreciate you engaging with us uh, any way you can, including asking us questions that we, as we show in this episode, we love to respond to. So with that, signing off. Cheers. 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 I finished my whiskey, but no, there's, there's a sip. Tiny sip. Thanks, guys.